the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Ah, the web tore. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Siri? This is how you deal with will! <laughs> no! Do not harm my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to! Do you know what lies within? Nothing. Rocket is in trouble, Akasa. Can can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar. No, but you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! I don't like free falling! Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. Hello, and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. My name is Anne Foster, and this is a very special episode. So this season, we're looking at the story of Mary Queen of Scots. It's a season called There's Something About Mary Queen of Scots. And this is the first episode where we're actually talking about Mary Queen of Scots herself in a direct way. We've previously talked about her grandmother, Margaret Tudor, her mother, Marie de Guise, her mother-in-law, Catherine de Medici. And today we're talking about Mary herself or beginning, beginning a, a long journée of discussing the whole situation of Mary Queen of Scots. And I do want to say, because she's kind of like a big name, and so some people might be listening to this and this is your first time listening to Vulgar History or whatever. So just so you know, what's what's going on? My name is Anne. Hi. And what this podcast is doing is talking about the stories of women in history in a way where there's jokes. We have a nice time. There are some some strange seeming to you, maybe a newcomer inside jokes that like if you listen to other episodes, you'll get it. But anyway, like I'm going to swear. I'm going to talk very conversationally. That's the deal. That's what this podcast is about. There's so many other podcasts that tell stories of people, including the story of Mary Queen of Scots, in a very like historical, scripted way. And if that's what you want, that's not what I'm giving you. <laughs> I'm here to have a, a casual chat. And I also see this podcast as kind of a dialogue. So even there's a couple of things I'm going to bring up in this episode that in previous episodes this season, I got some facts not quite right. And so I welcome well-intentioned corrections, especially of historical facts that I just like flat out get wrong. And I'm going to mention some of those in this episode. Anyway, I hope you're here for, for a good time because I mean, Mary Queen of Scots' story, it's famous. 
And what's interesting about it is she's always been a person or she's for a long time been a person I've been interested in. You should also know if you're a newcomer to this podcast that the TV show Rain, I consider to be the finest television series ever made. So I'm going to be mentioning that as well a lot. And honestly, it was that show that first started me kind of learning more about Mary Queen of Scots because the whole story, there's so many people in it. It's just less, it's like a historical enthusiast. There's other stories that are more straightforward to understand. Like um, if you look at the story of, I don't know, Cleopatra or something, or if you, even the story of Henry VIII and his six wives, like there's a narrative there that you can distill and abridge to explain it pretty well. Mary Queen of Scots' story and why I've held off doing it on this podcast for so long, even though she's a person who is of great interest to me, is that it is so complicated. There's like we're in multiple different countries, like there's so many characters. And in this episode, episode one, we're going to be focusing on the early years of her story, which is, I have to say, from just my past research I've done. And then in researching this podcast as well, I realized it's something that I hadn't really dived into a lot. And it's not a thing that people tend to dwell on when you're retelling her story in things like movies or biographies, because stuff happens, certainly, but it's kind of like the next part of her story is where things kind of get more, I don't know, like there's an impression that things get not more interesting, but more kind of like telenovela adjacent. But I'm going to say it was like that from the beginning, for sure. But anyway, I was preparing this podcast and I'm like, I know a story, blah, blah, blah. But I was looking back at like past things I've written about Mary Queen of Scots and I have like a sentence or two being like, yeah, she grew up in France and then she came back to Scotland. So it's like, thanks past me for not really delving into this. But also, you know what? Thanks past me because since the last time I researched this, there's more books have come out that really tell her story in new and interesting ways. And it was really, I was just sending messages to a um, friend of the podcast and frequent collaborator, Lana Wood Johnson being like, oh my God, Lana, did you know this? Did you know this? And Lana, Mary Queen of Scots is also one of her girls. That's also a person in history. Like she's read and reread the classic Antonia Fraser biography of Mary Queen of Scots over and over. And there's details I was saying, Lana, that she also didn't know. Like, so this, this is the story. And I'm going to be telling this from a point of view of explaining everything because even to people who know the story, like myself, you need, like a refresher is useful. But also I have been reminded by two different people actually have messaged me in the last little while, last few months, listeners, members of the Tits Out Brigade, new listeners, just so you know, the fandom of this podcast is called a Tits Out Brigade and they are a brigade and they're impressive and great people. And welcome now you're one of them. If you're listening to this, you're in the brigade. Anyway, so two Tits Out Brigade members separately messaged me just to say like they're enjoying the podcast, obviously. I mean, that's why they're in the brigade. But also I haven't ever done an episode about Queen Elizabeth I, for instance. I did a whole season previously about Lady Jane Grey and Elizabeth appears there here and there. She's popped up in a couple other episodes too, generally just being mad that somebody got married without her permission. But these people were saying like, yeah, actually, I don't know the story. Like they don't didn't know the story of Queen Elizabeth. So they're kind of coming at it sideways from me inserting her as sort of a tertiary character in these other people's stories. And one of them mentioned that they kind of don't really know the story of Anne Boleyn either. And I was like, you know what? I can't assume anyone listening to this knows any facts. So I'm just going to try to explain everything. And I hope that it's, you know, if you do know the story really well, especially I know people in Scotland who like know the story really well and the place names and the pronunciations, like, please know I'm doing my best. And yeah, so this is part one of numerous episodes about Mary herself, because I thought I was going to be able to cover twice as much in this today's episode as I was able to because it, there's a lot. There's a lot. This is going to be numerous episodes. And I wanted to let you know also, so I always do my best to cite my sources when I am doing these episodes. So if you want to read more about this, so I got my facts from a variety of places, including wikipedia.com a website that I don't know now in the age of like chat GPT I feel like I feel like the way that people are like oh Wikipedia the information's not good don't use it as a source it's like yeah like anything like any source it's like fallible and it relies on the information that's given to it by people but like it's then like vetted versus chat GPT which I've heard or seen people have been using for like historical research and chat GPT is like inventing fake book names and like getting main facts wrong anyway you know what, wikipedia.org, I respect them. I give them a monthly donation and I'm not gonna hear any slander about them not being good. I like them as sort of like a first line of defense. And I just, a lot of what I use them for in this was just like fact checking. I'm like, wait, who's that one? Wait, who is this person called James? Reader, 
or listener, <laughs> like in the Mary Queen of Scots Wikipedia page, there are 44 mentions of the name James and they're not all about one person. There's a lot of people in this story all called James. So right, this is where I've just like, he's the Earl of what? Wait, who is that? So fact checking is where I was using them. The main books. So there's a book that a listener sent to me and I'm so sorry, I don't have your name offhand. It's somewhere in my messages, but I super appreciate this. It's somebody who I figure if they're like either in Scotland or they visited Scotland and they saw that this book was in the gift shops and it's called Mary Was Here, where Mary Queen of Scots went and what she did there. It's a publication put out by Historic Scotland. So it's sort of like a large gift book with lots of pictures in it and it like goes castle by castle and also retelling the story of Mary Queen of Scots. And that's so, it's such a lovely book and thank you so much to that person who like couriered that to me. There's also a book called Embroidering Her Truth, Mary Queen of Scots in the Language of Power by Claire Hunter, which is a book all about textiles and embroidery in Mary Queen of Scots. And that's going to be something, pardon the pun, that's going to be woven throughout the whole story because she was a big embroiderer and textiles are a big part of this story. So that's a recent-ish book. I think it came out last year in the UK and it's just coming out in North America soon. I also looked at a book called Daughters of the North, Jean Gordon and Mary Queen of Scots by Jennifer Morag Henderson, which talks more about other parts of Scotland besides just Edinburgh, where Mary went. And then also the biography, Mary Queen of Scots, The True Life of Mary Stuart. Sometimes it is different titles. Sometimes it's just called Queen of Scots. Sometimes it's called Mary Stuart. Anyway, it's by John Guy, G-U-Y. And that's the book that was, I guess, optioned. And it was the basis for the Saoirse Ronan, Mary Queen of Scots movie. Anyway, it's like a very thorough biography of Mary Queen of Scots. And... My first correction, like we're getting into the, the story. Christina, that's our editor, Christina Lomagi. Can you put a timestamp to say actual discussion of Mary Queen of Scots starts at however many minutes this is in case people want to just like skip right there. Anyway, so my first correction is in the episode, I believe the Mary Marie de Guise episode, and that's Mary Queen of Scots' mom. There was uh, some incorrect information given it in that episode about who was the first King of Scots. In that episode, we said that it was Robert the Bruce, and that is incorrect. I was corrected by two different Scottish people, and I'm here to explain to you better about the history of monarchy in Scotland. And this is, it ties into the whole story, because you know Mary Queen of Scots is called Mary Queen of Scots. She's not called Mary Queen of Scotland. So it's always been a role that's the monarch of the people, not of the land, which is a distinction that is important. So according to tradition, The first king of Scots was Kenneth McAlpin, who founded the state in 843. So like the year 843. And originally this was the kingdom of the Picts, which became known as the kingdom of Alba in Scottish Gaelic, which later became known in Scots, Scots being its own language, which is different from English, but kind of sounds like English with a really strong accent. The same way that, I don't know, like German kind of sounds like English with an accent. Anyway, so Scots and English turned the Kingdom of Alba, started calling it Scotland. And Kenneth MacAlpin, first king of Scots. And then, you know, England, I said this out loud as just like thinking to myself in a previous episode where it's like, was England and Scotland just kind of always at war? Yes. Listeners, yes. Because they share a land border that it, it's not like there's a river or it's not like it's two different like it's just like now you're in Scotland now you're in England it's like of course that would kind of go back and forth where exactly the border is and there'd be fighting Kenneth MacAlpin first king of the Scots and then England took over for a while but then in 1306 Robert the Bruce he successfully won the land back from England and then his grandson was okay Robert the Bruce had a daughter called Marjorie great name. Love the name Marjorie. Is that not a Taylor Swift song title? Anyway, so Robert the Bruce had a daughter called Marjorie. Marjorie married, basically there's a whole thing about like the Stuart family. She married someone who was a Stuart. And then that kind of like combined the Bruce family with the Stuart family. And so then the first Stuart monarch was Robert the Stuart in 1371. So Robert the Stuart was the grandson of Robert the Bruce. So there's a thing about the Stuart dynasty kind of started with a lass, started with a woman and that woman was Marjorie. And then later people are going to be like, it started with, it went in with a lass and it went out with a lass and the, the lass or girl, which I think lass is Scott's word for girl, 
was Marjorie, the daughter of Robert the Bruce. So it's like Robert the Bruce had a daughter called Marjorie. Marjorie married a guy, and then their son was actually her spouse was Walter Stewart, the sixth high steward of Scotland. So Marjorie and Walter had a baby, and that baby was King Robert the Second of Scotland, the first Stuart monarch. Okay. And I'm just going to say now, hot take. Based on what I've been reading, the Stuart dynasty was a disaster, top to bottom, T to B. There was, and I don't mean them personally doing things that were disastrous. It's just like, I think there's kind of a curse because shitty things just kept happening to like almost all of the Stuart monarchs. So Robert the Stuart, um, he was like in his 40s or 50s when he came to power. So he couldn't rule, quote, vigorously, because I guess maybe he had some illnesses or things. And then his son, also called Robert, suffered lasting damage in a horse riding accident. So he also wasn't able to rule, quote, vigorously. And then there was a series of regencies, like a bunch of just like a boy king. I think it was, yeah, five boy kings happened. And so when you have a boy king, then someone needs to be the regent, right? Someone needs to do the like day-to-day ruling type stuff and enter the Scottish asshole lords, who we've mentioned before in the Marie de Guise episode. If you haven't heard those episodes yet, just know there's these men who are the nobles of Scotland, and they're just like this amorphous blob of just suck. They're just, they're the Scottish asshole lords. And they got more and more power because every time the new king ended up being a boy because the dad died, then they were like, oh, well, you know, the king is a child. So like we, the asshole lords, we need to rule in his stead. So they just kind of like over like generationally just acquired more and more sort of power and influence. So yeah, they just kind of usurped power from the crown. And then when that boy king, like these five boy kings, when they were adults, they would try to attempt to address the issues created by having been a boy king. But then they would die leaving the next boy king. And it just like kept happening. So the powerful nobility became increasingly intractable, a word which here means assholes. Um, Then we have James the first. So he attempted to, you know, straighten this out, curb the disorder of the realm. And he was assassinated. And then there's James II. This is of Scotland. James II of England, whole other guy, years later. James III, King of Scots, was killed in a civil war between himself and the nobility. And the civil war was led by his son, James IV. So James IV, he like did an okay job of suppressing the asshole lords and like trying to be like, okay, like I'm going to be the king and I'm going to have some power here. Let's go. He was the one who was married to Margaret Tudor, the sister of Henry VIII. But then James IV died in a battle. And then Margaret Tudor kind of stepped up to be regent for this next boy king. But eventually she was unseated by the asshole lords. And that boy king, the son of Margaret Tudor, was Mary Queen of Scots' dad, James V, or as I'm going to call him, J5. So J5 married a French woman whose name was... Marie de Guise, he also, prior to that, and during that, I'm going to say, had a whole lot of illegitimate children. So Mary Queen of Scots, numerous half-siblings, several of whom they're going to come up in the story. But Mary Queen of Scots was the first legitimate child, like born to the wife of J5. And here we are. She's born. So Mary. She was born on December 8th, 1542 at Linlithgow Palace in Scotland. And so I was telling you about that book that was written by like Historic Scotland. And it talks about all the palaces and like where, where Mary went and when. And she went to so many different places. I, I feel like one of her legacies is just to the tourism industry of Scotland because she went to so many places and every place can be like Mary Queen of Scots was here. So if you're there, if you visit there, one of the places to visit would be Linlithgow Palace. So that is where she was born. It was snowy because it was Scotland in December. And I'm not going to like architecturally describe all the palaces because there's like 75 characters to tell you about also. But Linlithgow is notable and it recurs. So I'm just going to tell you what's up with it a little bit. So Mary Queen of Scots' mom, Marie de Guise, was born and raised in France. Very French person. She loved, she was also from the de Guise family who were like wealthy and powerful. And Marie de Guise, she liked French architectural style. She liked French fashion style. 
And so she had redesigned Linlithgow Palace, which was already kind of like built in like kind of a quasi French style, but she had redesigned it in the manner of a French chateau. So this was one of her, her fave places to go. Like she did not want to be in Scotland, but if she's going to be there, she's going to make it feel like home to her. And just a moment to pause and talk about her Diggies family, because they're very important. And if you haven't listened to the Marie Diggies episodes yet, here's what's up. So the Diggies family, one of the most powerful noble families in France, it comprised of a lot of very powerful men, which some of the, these were her uncles, some of these were her brothers, all under the leadership, like the matriarch of his family was Marie de Guise's mom, Antoinette de Bourbon, who was very powerful and good at what she did and like really allowed this family to just like rise and rise and rise and keep flourishing. I was going to almost do an episode about Antoinette de Bourbon, but it wasn't a vulgar history episode because she just like did great. <laughs> There's not any sort of drama when she was faced with a challenge, like she met it and overcame it. It's a good way to live your life, but like not a vulgar history type story. So Mary Queen of Scots is born in Linlithgow Palace. Her mom, Marie de Guise. Her dad, J5, not on the scene for her birth because he was off fighting the English. There's a whole thing and... Longtime listeners of this podcast know I'm not here to share you the stories of like battles and like paperwork of treaties, but there's some that I'm going to have to describe to you in this podcast because otherwise the story won't make any sense. So just know if you picture geographically, we've got like England, Scotland is to the north of England, and then France is like to the east of that. They're all kind of close together. And so the Scots considered England the old enemy, and old is spelled A-U-L-D, which is the word in, I'm going to guess, Scots language. So because England and Scotland had been at war on and off for hundreds of years, right? Scotland had, was an ally of the French, or French was an ally of Scotland, and the main thing they had in common was Scotland and France both just hated England. And so France kind of saw like Scotland could be kind of like little France, like France could maybe kind of make that be France. And then once they had that, then they could maybe take over England. Whereas England was like, mm, we could take over Scotland and then we can take over France. So England and France, much bigger, more powerful countries, both had their eyes on Scotland. And so Scotland, they're allied with the French against the English, basically. This is why Mary's dad, J5, had married a French woman, Marie de Guise, just to kind of like keep that alliance like clear in everyone's minds. And so just for contrast, England at this point, like the 16th century, had a population of around 3.5 million. Scotland had a population at this time of around 850,000. So England is much bigger. There's more people there, more population density. At this point in Edinburgh, which was the largest Scottish town in the like south the lowlands of Scotland, there's about 13,000 people there, which was about one fifth the population of London. So England was just like a bigger place. France, also a bigger place, more people. But Scotland was just located in this really useful spot that both England and France kind of wanted it, wanted to take over. And let's talk about Scotland in this era for a minute, because that's also important. I mentioned the lowlands before. So between about a third and half of the population lived in the Highlands, which is like towards the north of Scotland. If you think about things like Outlander, the TV show, like that's the Highlands. So about a third to a half of the population lived there, wearing their kilts, speaking their own language, having their clans. And then the rest of the population, so two thirds ish, lived in the more prosperous and cosmopolitan lowlands region. So the king, J5, was advised by the asshole lords, aka technically the Scottish Parliament. And this was meant to represent the whole country, but it did not. So the Highland clans, as you may know, again, from Outlander, which is like 200 years set after this, or like the movie musical Brigadoon. So the Highland clans considered themselves separate. And there was an unspoken rule that the Highlanders and the Lowlanders just kind of like didn't fuck with each other. They just kind of like ignored each other. And that's how we could all just get on with our days. So many Highlanders spoke Gaelic or Gaelic rather than Scots. Um, and this added to just kind of the cultural differences. So while Scotland is, is it a kingdom? Is it a country? All one thing. There's the King of Scots 
but there was a real division between the lowlands and the highlands. So again, Mary just being born, <laughs> she's a little baby. J5 is off fighting the English. And speaking of the English, the king at this point of England was goddamn Henry VIII, who I feel needs no introduction. But just so you know, Henry VIII, he had six wives. The musical six will explain that whole story to you. And if you're familiar with Henry VIII's this deal, so at the point that Mary was born, he was between, he was currently single. He was between his fifth and sixth wives. So Catherine Howard had been executed 10 months before Mary Queen of Scots was born. And seven months after Mary Queen of Scots was born, Henry VIII married his sixth wife, Catherine Parr, who I talked about in a previous episode, in a previous season. So this is like late career, Henry VIII. And he had spent most of his adult life really hating Scotland, hating the Scots, the Scottish people. He didn't like the, how they allied with the French. He wanted to conquer Scotland so that he could then take over France and have like one big sort of like empire that's like, like where France is would be under his domain. Also, that was like his big goal. Anyway, so that's where the king is of England at this point. J5, Mary's dad, lost a battle. He was upset um, because of that, um, because it was like a pretty major loss. And then he heard, like he was not on the scene as Mary Queen of Scots was being born, but then like a messenger or whatever came and told him that his wife had a baby. He's like, great. But then he found out that it was a girl and he was just like, no, oh no, because just, you know, this is like a sexist, misogynist, patriarchal culture. And the son would just be like easier to, there'd been so many boy kings and it hadn't been like great, but like I was used to that, but like a girl, queen, he's just like, well, that's it then for this dynasty. And this is where he allegedly said, it will end as it began. It came from a woman and it will end in a woman or it came from a lass and it will end we a lass. But which he means the Stuart dynasty started with Marjorie. And I guess he was saying like, well, now that this daughter has been born, God damn it, the dynasty is going to end. Oh, contraire, but that's spoilers. And I'm really trying to be mindful in this episode and all the American Queen Scots episodes to not let you know what's going to happen next because I'm coming from a place and a lot of the biographies I read are also coming from a place where you kind of assume that a reader might know the story. So you just kind of want to tie things to what happens in the future. But a lot of you don't know the story. And I want you to like be as shocked and appalled by the plot twist as possible. So we're going to meet lots of people and I'm not going to tell you what way to think about them. Maybe they're going to be okay. Maybe they're not. I'm just going to try and be like really in the moment here. Anyway, so James to him, he's just like, well, fuck this Stuart dynasty. That's done. The end. And then he died of illness. Um, his symptoms included marvelous vomit and a great lax, aka diarrhea. So probably dysentery from drinking water with poo in it, as so many people died of before we, we, the human race, knew to not shit near your water source. So J5 himself, he had become king aged 17 months um, when his own father had died. And now he, like in the Stuart way, was leaving a new baby monarch. The asshole lords were just kind of like, yes, I, we, we come to expect this. Anyway, so you think 17 months old is young to be a monarch? Guess what? Mary Queen of Scots, six days old. And she is now the queen. So like, let's go. So Mary herself, she was named Mary after her mother. So her mother is Marie de Guise, but like the Scots, an English version of Marie is Mary. And also this is an era in time in which people really just spelling even within a document, I think, you just kind of like, meh, how are we going to spell this today? I don't care. So she's named Mary after her mother, which a long time Tits Ed Brigade members will know. There is a vulgar history bingo card. You can find it in my highlights on Instagram. Maybe I'll put it on the website too. Anyway, one of the spots in the bingo card is when a woman names her daughter after herself, because I just love it. I appreciate that. I think it's been so much in history where a man names his son after him. So when a woman names the daughter after herself, I think that's great. And I feel like let's bring him back. She was also named Mary because her birthday was December 8th, which is a day celebrated by the Roman Catholic Church as the day that the Virgin Mary had been conceived. And her mother was a big old Catholic. So too was Scotland, a Catholic nation. That becomes important later. So as she was six days old, obviously, they had to find someone who was an adult to like be in charge of <laughs> running everything, aka a regent. And so I think largely because of the succession of boy kings 
and the ascension of the asshole lords, monarchy in general as like an institution in Scotland was not as strong as in other countries. Like in England, Henry VIII was like had kind of ultimate power. Over in France, the French king had like so much power and influence. But in Scotland, it was kind of like the monarch and or regent had to keep a delicate balance of the constantly scheming asshole lords. So who kind of saw themselves, there's like, anyway, they just kind of saw themselves as kind of like co-kings. And you couldn't just tell them what to do because then they would assassinate you as they had in the past done to previous kings. Anyway, so they're like, who's going to be the new regent? So of course, all the asshole lords are like me, like all of them and then infighting. So one candidate for the role of regent is a guy called David Beaton, who is a Catholic cardinal, and he had been friends with Mary's dad, J5. And David Beaton, like, I know I just was like, I'm going to let you discover for yourself. He sucks. Just know he sucks. And if you know the musical Brigadoon, I don't know how much of a niche reference that is. I'm a big theater kid, so to me it's not. But there's a song in that where there's a character in it called Harry Beaton who runs away. And there's a song where they're kind of yelling in this echoey way. They're like yell singing, Harry Beaton. So every time I have the name David Beaton in my notes, I have it written out like David Beaton. Anyway, he sucks. So one of the things he did was he faked a will because like J5 died and no one thought he was going to, which it's like, you know what, given like the previous five monarchs of Scotland, maybe you should have written a will. You're going off to war, like write a will. Anyway, he hadn't, but David Beaton was like, oh, he totally did write a will. And when, you know, he left everything to me, including I should be the regent and the king or something. Everyone was like, no, fuck you. You're obviously lying. And he was, but he had like a faction He was kind of like the most powerful Catholic asshole lord. And so like the Catholics were like, great, him. He can be the regent, even though he sucks. The other option for regent was a Protestant person named James Hamilton, the Earl of Arran. And we're going to call him Arran because he's going to be in this a lot. And as I mentioned before, 44 different people named James. So Arran was actually next in line to the throne after Mary. Because his, like, even though J5 had had all these illegitimate children, like, that's not how things worked for King of Scots. Illegitimate children couldn't just, like, wouldn't be named the next king. So Arryn, his paternal grandmother, was the eldest daughter of James II. So basically, he's, like, a distant relative. He is descended in a roundabout sea way from the kings of Scots. And so he was chosen as regent, Arryn. And basically everybody supported him because David Beaton sucks. Marie de Guise did not support him, but we get into that in the Marie de Guise episodes. And one of the reasons she did not support him was he was Protestant and she was Catholic. And she's like, I feel like if we choose a Protestant regent, this country is going to become Protestant. And that's like the number one thing I don't want to have happen. Note about Aaron. He also sucked. Like there's no good options here. So here's some descriptions of him from like biographies. So he was weak, vacillating, cowardly. And he throughout his life would switch back and forth between being Catholic and Protestant, just like a little greebly worm, depending on like what would suit him better. So he's not like, I'm Protestant and this is meaningful to me. He was just like, I'll choose whatever religion I need to like get some more power or whatever. So again, another reason why Marie de Guise didn't want him because he sucked. And Marie de Guise is a great source for just like a great quote. She is responsible for the quote, where is your God now, John Knox? which is available on merch at vulgarhistory.com slash store. But here's another great Marie Duguay's quote. She described Arryn as a simple and the most inconstant man in the world for whatsoever he determined today, he changeth tomorrow. So he would just change depending on whatever. This all happened. Henry VIII down in England. He's like, great, here's my plan. I propose you send baby queen Mary Queen of Scots to England. She'll grow up here. And then Henry VIII at this point had a five-year-old son who was called Edward. And he was like, well, we'll send Mary here. She can marry Edward when they come of age. And then they'll be kind of like co-monarchs. And eventually that will lead to England subsuming Scotland and all being one big country. Thank you so much. Marie de Guise was like, fuck you, no. And then she used her cleverness and beauty to usurp control from the asshole lords. Again, that's all in her episode. Can't get into that here. We've already been talking for a really long time. So knowing that Henry was just kind of like really excited to invade Scotland some more, she moved baby Mary from Linlithgow to a castle called Stirling, which was better fortified. Like it would be harder for, you know, people to come in and try and kidnap her or whatever. 
Stirling is a castle, which you can visit still today in Scotland. It's a fortress at the top of a steep rock. And it's also near enough to the coast that like ships could get there. So like if France was going to come and help out, like they could easily reach her there. So anyway, well, actually, no, she said, I'm going to do this. And Aaron, who was like technically in charge, was like, mm, I'm not going to let you do that. And she was like, watch me. And she did. And so at this point, as she's like going to Sterling, another guy comes on the scene who unfortunately matters. And his name is Matthew Stewart, the Earl of Lennox. We're going to call him Lennox for short. So Lennox was the head of a minor branch of the Stewart family. Every goddamn person in this story has the surname Stewart because of all the, like Stewart was a family before they were the monarchs, but then also all the kings kept having illegitimate children. It's just like the last name of everybody. Anyway, Matthew Stewart was a French subject. He was also one of the asshole lords. So should something happen to Arryn, he had a claim to maybe be a good regent next to. Um, he also had a sort of scheme that he was like, mm, and if I can like seduce Marie of Guise, then I can marry her and then I'll be the regent and maybe kind of the king and I can take over, blah, blah, blah. And Mar- Marie of Guise was like, whatever, this guy's useful. And so she got him to provide uh, bodyguards And when you think bodyguards, you think like maybe one guy, maybe like 10 guys. Lennox provided 2,500 cavalry and 1,000 infantry. And that was who escorted Marie de Guise and baby Mary to Stirling and to safety. Guess what? They got there safely. So then the asshole lords are just like scrambling, scrambling. Arryn, like the greebly little guy he is, agreed to work together with David Beaton because I don't care, but whatever. All this put together means that Mary got to be crowned as queen at a little coronation for a baby, a little baby coronation, a little baby crown. So Marie de Guise, she's 28 years old, gorgeous. I didn't mention that in this episode yet, but she is. And people mention that she's really charismatic as well. She's like six feet tall. And I mean, I don't mean like she's like, six, she like literally was six feet tall. She was so tall for a woman in that era and time and place. Gorgeous, beautiful, so smart, like every scheming asshole wanted to marry her or get her to marry their son, or marry themselves to the baby, or have their son marry baby Mary Queen of Scots. It's just like a woman and her daughter. And everyone was like, if we can marry either of them, we, the men, will have so much power and take over Scotland. Um, But Marie de Guise, just she played them off each other masterfully. Again, we talk about that in the Marie de Guise episodes. So one of the guys who wanted to marry her was Lennox. Another guy who wanted, who's like a main sort of like guy who wanted to marry her was named Patrick Hepburn. No relation to my cat, whose name is Hepburn. No relation. I just really want to emphasize. So Patrick Hepburn was the Earl of Bothwell. And he was a shitty person who had been exiled by J5 to Denmark for being, quote, unruly. So like, I don't know if Denmark was previously, like how for a while England would send prisoners to Australia. Like was Denmark just the place you just like send people to? I don't know. Anyway, he was just like newly back in town being like, what's up, fellow Scots? And eventually he spread a rumor that Marie de Guise was choosing him, which was not true. But Lennox heard the rumor, believed it. And he was so mad that he switched teams entirely. He suddenly decided to team up with Henry VIII. He went to England and then he married Henry VIII's niece, who is called Margaret Douglas, who we've spoken about in a previous episode in a previous season, the women trapped in towers season. And they're going to have a son who's going to become important later on. So I just wanted to let you know who he was and how he sucked. Anyway, wars are happening. England and Scotland. (laughs) Mary is a literal toddler and she's kept safe in Stirling Castle. But the people around her had a plan where if things kind of, if she got real, like they would maybe take her off to like the Highlands where she could maybe be better hidden if needed. Uh, Scotland did not do amazing in these battles. Everyone blamed Arryn because he probably was to blame. Meanwhile, Marie de Guise was popular and she managed to get a seat at the table with the asshole lords. And her French relatives, the de Guises, helped out with war stuff. And also, I love this detail I hadn't read before. They heard that she didn't have any good wine on hand. And so they sent her good French wine from France, which God knows she needed at this point. Anyway, David Beaton is still on the scene and he's just being like Catholic. And there's a guy who he decided to execute by, uh, what do you call it? Like when you like light them on fire, but he also put like gunpowder in the fire. So it's really dramatic. But the guy who he burned was actually really popular and also nice. And like even the Catholics liked him. So it was a pretty shitty thing to do. This made people upset especially the Protestants. And so he got himself assassinated by a group of asshole lords. 
from his own hometown, including a man named Norman Leslie, who I'm just mentioning. He doesn't come up in the story again, I don't think, but I, I'm not descended from Norman Leslie, but there is the surname Leslie in my heritage. And I like to think that maybe someone who I'm descended from was involved in killing this shitty guy. And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch, and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and, for shoppers, buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not so secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going. If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today shopify.com slash realm with your long forgotten name we call upon you we call upon you in the words of the unspeakable language we call upon you we call upon you by the spilt blood of the wicked who walk upon this world sprouting the words of false idols we call upon you we call upon you on the land of the dead harvest, that which brings the earth itself into your service, Yamal, we call upon you. We call upon you. We call upon you. We call upon you. Yamal calls upon you. The Sprouting, a Call of Cthulhu actual play podcast by Blighthouse Studio. Find us on your podcatcher of choice. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of the podcast Only One in the Room. Every week, my co host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. And we're back. And I like this detail too. So David Beaton, they came in, they like captured him in his house. And then before they assassinated him, they forced him to listen to a long winded sermon. They're just like, blah, 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 Protestantism is great, blah, blah, blah. And then he was stabbed and his naked body hung from the castle walls by knotting sheets together to make a rope. I share these details just to say, this is what it was like in Scotland at this time. Like the asshole lords were just like stabbing people. A bunch of them after this, like kind of stayed in his home and then they kind of barricaded themselves in there. Uh, they had, anyway, the French eventually got them and captured them and sent them off to France. And one of those people was John Knox, who we're going to talk about later. Anyway, so <laughs> he's dead. David Beaton, he was the chancellor. And so the asshole lords are like, shit, we need a new chancellor because we just killed that one. And so as the new chancellor, they chose a man who was the Earl of Huntley, a.k.a. George Gordon. And I think you understand why I'm going to refer to him solely by his nickname, which was Cock o the North. So Cock o the North was extremely influential and important. And we will talk about him in later episodes in more detail. But just I just wanted to let you know that this is when he's on the scene in this context. He was a Catholic and all the people in the northern bits of Scotland, like the Highlands and also other parts in the north saw him as kind of like their leader, like kind of not their king, but it's kind of like, you know, how in Game of Thrones, Ned Stark was kind of like in charge of like Northern Westeros. It's kind of like that vibe. But cock of the North, cooler than Ned Stark. Anyway, so Henry VIII died and his son, Edward, became boy king over there. So many boy kings in this story. He's like, so, so much has been going on. Like when they first were like, he should marry Mary. He was five. Now he's nine. 
And then two months later, the king in France died, leaving the new king in France was an adult, Henri II, who is the husband of Catherine de' Medici, who we've talked about before in previous episodes. And so the de Guise family, Mary's maternal family, were like super powerful and they were like heavily advising the king. And they were like, you know what? You should have your son, the French Dauphin, which is the word for like heir to the throne in France. The de Guises were like, you should marry the Dauphin to Mary, Queen of Scots, our baby niece. At around the same time, goddamn John Knox is here. So David Beaton had been assassinated by the asshole lords for like burning a man. So the burned man had been one of John Knox's mentors. John Knox was described as one of his bodyguards. So John Knox was one of the people who like stayed in the castle after the assassination. And then they were captured by the French. And then he, along with these other guys, were forced to row in French galleys, which was like their version of prison for 18 months, which is big Jean Valjean energy from Les Miserables. Anyway, but then it's just like England, France, Scotland, like who's allying with who and when and where and why. But at this point, for some reason, the English arranged for his release. And so he went to London. And this is because England, Edward is the new king, Protestantism is happening there. And they're like, well, these guys are Protestants, these like Jean Valjean guys. All right, John Knox goes to England. The person who mediated his release was a young secretary named William Cecil, who's going to become important later. John Knox got a job as chaplain to the boy king of England. I regret to inform you, John Knox is going to come up numerous times throughout the rest of these episodes. Anyway, more wars are happening. Mary, age 4.75, like four and three quarters, had to be carried away at one point to um, Inchmahom Priory, a remote spot on an island in the Lake of Menteith, which just seemed like a safer place for her to be there for a while. And there's these beautiful trees there. And apparently those trees can date back to her time there. And so you can picture just this little, you know, almost five-year-old Mary just being like, I don't like everything is chaos, but it's nice here, I guess. So then Arryn, still there, he made a deal with the French king in which Arryn was named the Duke of Châteauhiru, and he was promised a bride for his son, who we're going to call Arryn Jr., because his son is also called James. And then also plans were finalized to marry Mary Queen of Scots to the French Dauphin Francis, who is one year younger than her. And so, you know, at this point, it's like, thank God, she's going to France. Scotland is just like, who wants to be there at that point? So to get ready for this international move, Mary was moved to Dumbarton Castle, which used to belong to goddamn Lennox, but had been confiscated from him when he switched to Team Henry VIII. While there, she caught either the measles or smallpox, which is just like, fuck, what are we going to do if she dies? But she did not. She got better. And so one day in late July, Mary, aged five and a half, kissed her mother goodbye and boarded the royal galley of Henri II. So the journey was rough. There's something like... They got on the ship and actually they had to stay on the ship for a week before the ship could even set sail because the journey was so rough. But this is where we learned that Mary Queen of Scots had a superpower that I share, which is iron stomach, which is I do not get carsick. I do not get seasick. I don't know why I'm so lucky, but I do not. And neither did she. Everyone else on the ship was like puking their guts out and she was fine. And so who else was on the ship? Well... She was accompanied by her own court, including four friends whose names were all Mary. So they were four girls, her own age, all called Mary. I saw a rumor that they all had to change their names to Mary so they could have the same name as her, but it's just, no, it's just everyone the same name. The four Marys, I'm not going to get into them too much now because they're going to have their own episode later. They were daughters of some of the most noble families in Scotland, Beaton, Seton, Fleming, and Livingston. So... Mary Fleming is one of the Marys. She apparently, when they were like stuck in the ship for a week and they couldn't leave, like she, she's got an attitude. I like, she's got some personality. She's just like, get me off the ship. They wouldn't let her. Anyway, so the also coming along was a governess. So Mary Fleming is one of the four Marys. Her mom, Janet, is also the governess to Mary Queen of Scots. I just need to let you know that Janet Fleming was gorgeous. She was curvaceous and vivacious. And like, just know that she's gonna, people in France are gonna be very interested in her. Also on the ship was one of Mary Queen of Scots's illegitimate half siblings, a brother whose name is James Stewart, which is also the name, like, again, lots of people called James had to think of a nickname. And the first one that came to mind is James Stewart, Jimmy Stewart, the Hollywood actor from It's a Wonderful Life and Vertigo. So I'm going to just always call this guy Hollywood icon, 
Jimmy Stewart, by which I mean Mary Queen of Scots's illegitimate half brother. So he was older than her. He's 17. She's five. Um, he was going to Paris to go to university. So Mary eventually arrived. So Henri II and Catherine de' Medici at this point had, I think, four children. So Mary was five. Francis, her like child fiance, was four. And then there's also girls. There's Elizabeth. There's Claude. A younger brother named Louis, who would sadly die of measles before his second birthday. And later, four more children joined the nursery. Charles Henry Marguerite, a.k.a. Queen Margot, who we've done an episode about. And then another son also called Francis. So basically, she's just she's coming over and she gets to grow up in the royal nursery with the princes and princesses who are like of similar age. That's nice. So Mary, at this point, she spoke Scots and almost no French. So she was it became a French immersion situation. And in fact, the four Marys were sent out away because they didn't want her to have too many Scottish people around her. They wanted her to be surrounded by basically French people only. So the four Marys were sent off to a convent school elsewhere. But don't worry, they're going to come back. Her governess, Janet, became a mistress of the king because she was gorgeous. She was fubs and gorgeous. She ended up having his child. And at that point, she was sent back to Scotland and Mary got a different governess who was not sexy. But yeah, she was deliberately, deliberately severed from her native culture and encouraged to form new attachments with her new French acquaintances. Because she was being sent to France to be the Queen of France, presumably she would live in France the rest of her life. So Francis, her boy fiancé, was known to be frail and sickly. And so she quite astutely, like this little five-year-old Mary, she figured out like she needed to sort of compensate because the two of them were to become a team. She knew they're going to get married when they got older. So she had to kind of like mask his deficiencies and be like, oh, what my husband meant to say was this. And she was good at it. She grew very close with him. They, they delighted in each other. They got along super well. Again, he's just one year younger than her. So they're similar age. Their delight in each other caused one observer to remark that Dauphin cares for her and loves her like his sweetheart and his wife, and that it is easy to judge that God caused them to be born for each other. And if you've watched Rain the TV show, like Mary and Francis, like I ship it, like those two together. So yeah, she's just like growing up in France. Two years later, like she's just in France growing up. I'm going to explain her education stuff in a minute, but um, she didn't see her mom for two years. Marie de Guise came to visit because her dad had died and she wanted to just kind of like check in and see what's going up in France. While she was visiting, though, a plot was uncovered to assassinate Mary Queen of Scots which is one of those guys from the David Beaton assassination. Like these guys, not John Knox, a different guy. So this guy came to France with a plan to assassinate Mary by poisoning her, by kind of like getting in cahoots with the chef. <laughs> he wanted to poison her favorite dessert, frittered pears. But then he was found out. The guy was discovered. He fled to first Ireland and then to Scotland, but he was caught, sent back to France for trial and execution. So Again, the first, like the season one, episode one of Rain starts with someone tries to poison her. So like, accurate. But anyway, so that all happened. She didn't die. Marie de Guise wound up going back to Scotland. Also during the same time, so Marie de Guise had had, we talked about this in the other episode, but she had had a son with her first husband who was in France and that son died while she was visiting. So sad. Anyway, um, in her absence, Marie, Mary, Queen of Scots, her new mentor was her mother's brother, Charles or as I call him, Uncle Charlie, the Cardinal of Lorraine. He was the boldest and most experienced politician at Henri's court. Her other uncle, Francis, Duke of Guise, also helped out in a mentor sort of way. And he's sort of like a surrogate father and she would always love him the rest of her life. Like she really looked up to him and had a really close relationship with him. When she was 11, Uncle Charlie came up with a plan to declare her of age, which usually... That would be when she's 15 or 18. You know, it's like you want to be like, she can be queen now, so she doesn't need a regent anymore. Because they wanted to dismiss useless Arin and name Marie de Guise as the regent. And the French king agreed. And then this happened. So at this point, Mary, she wasn't in the nursery anymore. She had her own household. She was in the midst of various growth spurts. She needed lots of new outfits. She wanted to keep up with all the trends, like getting monogram sewn onto her dresses and stuff. And at around the same time, so when she was like a tween age person, she fell seriously ill for the first time we know of. Like she'd had measles before, but this was like startling to people. So Mary in general, it's sort of giving me Empress Cece energy. She's very athletic. She loved to go horseback riding. She was like playing tennis. She, like she's very athletic and like seemingly quite healthy, but she had this health crisis. And so this recurs in her life. So I'm going to talk about it for just a minute. So often this was triggered by anxiety or stress. 
and sometimes these periods would um not periods not like menstrual periods but these like attacks for lack of a better word sometimes they would last for days sometimes for weeks and afterwards she would bounce back like almost right away so potentially like her later descendant george the third the husband of queen charlotte some people theorize she might have had a condition called porphyria which is like a thing that lies dormant most of the time but can be triggered and when it comes out the symptoms would be similar to what she had, which is like vomiting, abdominal pain, overwhelming depression and crying and mood swings. So we're going to talk about her health in other later episodes. But like periods of stress, I think she would like because of the stress, she would like lose her appetite, not be able to eat. Porphyria can be triggered by like fasting or not eating enough. And so then she would get these 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 things would happen. Doctors obviously useless. The mood swings of it all. Later in her life, Mary would wear an amethyst ring that she believed had properties like magical properties, like people believe in crystals and stuff now, like that this could help her melancholy, her mood swings. She got really seriously sick at this point. I think she also, this is maybe not a porphyria attack, but I want to talk about that. At this point, it sounds like it might have been sweating sickness Um, and she was ill for months. Her fiance, Francis, also got this at the same time, but both of them recovered. So her education. She was really well educated and this really switches depending on where we're talking about on this podcast and what country or whatever. But in this era, the French king was really into education, including for girls and women. So she was educated basically identically to Francis, the Dauphin. So the other princesses did as well. They're all schooled together. So she learned Latin, Greek, Italian, Spanish. Her education was overseen by Catherine de Medici, Diane de Poitiers, who is the mistress, the very influential mistress of the king, and her uncle Charlie. And it's not like they were there directly tutoring her, but they helped choose her tutors and things like that. It was noted when she was 12, one of her assignments was to deliver a speech, not a prepared speech, but just like one that she made up on the spot. In Latin, she had to present it to the king, to Catherine de Medici, and to her uncles. But she got to choose the topic and the topic she chose was a defense of the education of women. So that speaks to her interests. And so she studied the classics, but she was much more um, enthusiastic about French poetry. In fact, she became patron to a poet named Ronsard. She helped him to publish the first edition of his works. And he, she supported other French poets as well. And the poets she supported, like they were loyal to her throughout her life. They sent her verses, um, providing emotional reassurance during some of her bleakest and most anxious moments. Her hobbies included singing, dancing, playing the lute, the clavichord, and the harp. And she was talented, like she was fine at all of these things, but where she really excelled was at dancing. And the king saw that she was really good at dancing, so he hired an Italian dancing master to help train her up even more. And she sought out every opportunity to perform dancing whenever there was like some sort of party, because, and she was really good. Everyone said she was really good. She also loved embroidery. She had a personal embroiderer who would like embroider her outfits and stuff, but this person taught her. Catherine de Medici encouraged this interest because Catherine de Medici, and I didn't know this, so I didn't mention it in her episodes, she herself was a skilled embroiderer. She'd been trained back in her days when she was at a convent in Florence and the convent she happened to be at, Catherine de Medici, as a girl was one where the nuns were famous for their needlework. Mary also loved making preserves like marmalade. So she specialized in making a kind of French marmalade. And to do so, she put on an apron. She'd boil quinces and sugar with powder of violets in a saucepan for hours before laying out the slices of crystallized fruits. The four Marys also helped out with this like jam hobby. And in fact, like a play kitchen was made in their apartment so they could play and pretend like they were cooking and housekeeping. And they like to pretend to be servants or like peasant women organizing their domestic routine and doing their own shopping and That continues throughout their life, but we'll talk about that in another episode. But they do like disguises, let's just say, some of which include pants. So Mary loved animals. She loved pets. She wanted as many as possible around her. Um, She loved dogs, especially terriers and spaniels. At one point, she had 16 dogs and kitchen staff were given just standing orders to save table scraps to feed her dogs. She also loved, she was a horse girl. Again, like the CC vibes are here. So she wanted to ride horses, but she was a kid. She couldn't fit on a horse. So she rode ponies, um, and then as she got taller, she rode horses. She also enjoyed falconry, which is like where you have a falcon and you train it to like, you wear like the leather glove and it lands on your arm and it flies away and comes back. She had her own pet falcon, and apparently she took to this really quickly. Um, She was able to cast off and reclaim on her own without help from the falconers. 
And there's the Royal Diaries series of like children's books from like the early 2000s. And the one about Mary Queen of Scots on the cover, I think she's doing falconry. Let me know if I'm right. She also loved hunting, which was just a thing all the rich people like to do. Crucial detail. So Catherine de Medici had the habit of um, when she went out hunting or horseback riding, she would wear like trousers inside of her skirts so that she could ride astride. Like instead of, you know, ladies in oldie times in some societies had to ride, sit sideways on the horse. Like that's how Empress Cece would ride. But Catherine de Medici just rode horses in what I would call the normal way with like your legs spread apart and the horse under you. And to do that, you would wear pants. Mary Queen of Scots did this as well. She loved horseback riding with pants under a skirt. She also learned to play tennis and golf. Fun fact, playing golf in France, it was a tradition that the French military cadets would carry the clubs for royalty. So the word cadet, which means younger brother or younger son, traveled with Mary when she would later return to Scotland. She pronounced cadet caddy with her accent. And that is golf now. People have a caddy. That was her. Remember that? Episodes from now when we're doing significance. Because she popularized golf. I just like this detail. At one point, the king had bears, like literal bears, sent for the in- entertainment of the royal children. I don't know what that he thought would happen, but the bears damaged the home of a neighbor. And it's like, yeah, maybe don't like bring bears to your castle. Mary was like her mom, beautiful. She, everybody complimented her and it's not in like a fake way because she was so important. She was like very lovely to the aesthetic standards of the era. She had very pale sort of peaches and cream complexion, which was like what people wanted in this time and place. She also had red hair that she wore in a way that I keep seeing described as crimped. So in like very tight curls. And if you look at the portraits of her, like along the hairline, like it's really, it looks like she has a perm. So either she had really curly hair or the Marys helped her do that more in a future episode. She's also very tall, like her mom. Her height was probably like her mom, like somewhere between five foot 10 and six feet tall. And in this era and place and time, a five foot four woman was considered tall. So she was just like striking, stunning, red hair, pale skin, super tall, really graceful and elegant. And people who met her were just like, oh my God, she's gorgeous. So she was also trained in spycraft. So how to write secret letters using ciphers, um, not to leave letters around where anyone could find them. That being said, she was also like, she had people were advising her, namely her uncles, and she just like trusted them. So she was very trusting. Is this going to be a problem later on? We'll see. But for instance, as an example of her just like trusting and doing what she was told, she would like sometimes send her mother just blank pieces of paper, but with her signature at the bottom so that other people could write on it what it was supposed to say, which is kind of could be dangerous when you're in an asshole lord's scenario, but I don't think anything bad ever came of that. But it just shows that she's kind of like very trusting. Also, when she wrote, I found this endearing. She often started out writing very neatly on the first page, but by the second or third page, she began to rush. And if you look at her embroideries, it's similar. Like, I think she just liked to get stuff done quickly. Anyway, so she was really highly educated. Her uncles had wanted that. The king had wanted that. But jokes on them, because in so doing, they taught her how to think independently and to question what they told her and also how to debate really well. She learned how to argue a case and spot the strengths and flaws in the reasonings of others. So they're like, oh, shit, this isn't a pawn anymore. This is like an intelligent, glamorous person. So she got married when she was 15 and Francis was 14. So they were married at the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris and like everyone in town showed up kind of like how there was just the coronation of Charles III in England. It's just kind of like there's there's a procession, there's a carriage and just like the streets are lined with people who are just like want to see a spectacle. And in fact, knowing that the king had arranged the marriage ceremony to be largely outdoors, there's kind of like a stage set up outside with an awning over it. So the ceremony was preceded by months of negotiation between Scottish asshole lords um, led by... Hollywood icon, Jimmy Stewart, Mary's half-brother. And in fact, he was there. He witnessed the wedding. He was among the crowds outside of Notre Dame. And he had been hanging out. Remember, he was going to university in Paris. He had been spending his time with English and Scottish exiles who were all kind of like, we like being Protestant. We don't like having French Catholic troops in Scotland. And he was just kind of like, I don't know if I'm a fan of this wedding I'm watching that's Catholic. Anyway, Mary looked incredibly amazing. She wore a white dress, which was an unconventional choice because in France in this time, white was the traditional color for mourning, not for like celebrating. 
But here's the thing. She knew white was her color. She knew she looked good in white. And so she's just like, fuck you. My wedding dress is going to be white. She wore her hair long, flowing free, which was also unconventional. So her white gown had a long train, like she had her long flowing auburn, crimped hair. Uh, she also had a purple velvet over mantle, which is kind of like a cloak embroidered in gold with the arms of Scotland. And her white dress was covered with uh, jewels, like literal diamonds. On her head, she wore a crown ablaze with diamonds, emeralds, sapphires, and pearls. So just picture this outside also on a sunny day, just the way the light would catch her. It would just look like an angel. Also want to note that her very impressive crown during the wedding banquet became too heavy for her to wear. And so an attendant had to just like hold it on above her head for her, which is like a power move. Anyway, so they got up on the stage. And so this, the sort of like awning slash tent outdoor wedding venue was a blue silk canopy decorated in the fleur de lis done in gold thread. And it was like a really happy time for her. That morning, she wrote a letter to her mother that said, that she was one of the happiest women in the world. In Scotland, her mother arranged celebrations, including processions, bonfires were lit. Everyone's like, woo, our queen got married, yay. Like, people just like a reason to celebrate. And then in a section that I have in my notes called Goddamn Paperwork, I re- truly don't want to have to tell you about treaties because that's not the sort of history that I'm personally interested in and I'm bad at explaining it, but he- this is an important one. So the De Guises were like so in control of so much stuff right now. They were so influential. And so they basically this document was prepared by them. That said basically Scotland belongs to France now. If Mary dies without having any children, then Francis, like her husband, will take over and the like French royal family will be in charge of Scotland. Scotland is now little France. The asshole lords, and for once I'm like, yeah, I can see this. We're mad about this because the Scottish independence was and is like fundamental part of like Scottish nationalism. They were just like, no, we don't want Scotland to be mini France. Arryn, in fact, joined with the Protestants to oppose this. Like everyone in Scotland was like on board to be like, no, we don't like this. But even just the existence of the document and hearing about it made the asshole lords even more determined to maintain their own rights and privileges. Because remember, there's not a powerful king or queen in Scotland. Like they were just like, this is why there can't be one because they'll do shit like this. Anyway, meanwhile, in England, so last time we checked in there, Edward had been the boy king. He died. And then he, Jane Grey was the queen for nine days. And then the next monarch was Mary I. She died after a short period of rule. And then she was succeeded by Henry VIII's only other legitimate child, Elizabeth I, who was at this point 25 years old. So like Mary was 15, Elizabeth is 25. So they're both young women, but she's adult aged. Crucially, Elizabeth chose as her chief minister a guy named William Cecil, who we mentioned before. He was the one who helped negotiate John Knox's release. William Cecil, going to be really important in this story. So remember that name. But here's the thing. The Deguises were like, wait, (laughs) the Queen of England is this 25-year-old Elizabeth? Like, this is like a great opportunity for us, the Deguises. So because basically all of France was like, we don't accept her as Queen of England. Like, no thanks. And I'll explain why. So some people, Catholic people in this era, felt that Elizabeth was illegitimate. Um, Like she's literally an illegitimate child of Henry VIII is what some people believed because she kind of was and she kind of wasn't. So the thing is that Mary, Queen of Scots' claim to the throne of England at this point was like compared to Elizabeth's, her claim was at least as strong as hers, potentially stronger. So Mary's claim would be through her grandmother was Henry VIII's sister. And if Henry VIII had died without any children, then like, who are you going to go to next? And Mary Queen of Scots was like a good candidate in that sort of like family tree sort of way. And so Catholics thought that Elizabeth was illegitimate because. So Elizabeth I was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. So Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII had gotten married while Henry VIII's first wife, Catherine of Aragon, was still alive. The Pope and the Catholic Church did not recognize Anne Boleyn as Henry's lawful wife because Catherine was still alive and they didn't believe in divorce. So Henry, like this was fine. Like Elizabeth was born like nine months after Henry and Anne got married. But then later Henry turned on Anne Boleyn. He divorced her and then executed her. And when she was executed at that point, Elizabeth was literally declared to be illegitimate by an act of parliament in a clause that had at that point never been repealed. So, and then Henry VIII died, you know, years later. And 
the whole thing is like there's a there's a case for why one might consider Elizabeth to be illegitimate if you were a Catholic person who didn't want her to be the queen. Whereas Mary, Queen of Scots, like there's nothing illegitimate about her claim whatsoever. Like there's no it's direct line from like king to queen to whatever. So the de Guises were like, great. So they they in France just proclaimed Mary was queen of England, Scotland and Ireland. And it's not like they were like, oh, because she's illegitimate. They're like, she's Protestant and we don't want a Protestant queen. But they're also like, but what we can say is she's illegitimate and we don't want an illegitimate queen. Like that was easier to sort of defend. So Uncle Charlie ordered. So the like heraldic arms of England, it's just sort of like that thing that looks like a shield. So they, they made like a new heraldic arms that was like part France, part Scotland, part England, just to be like, it's all one country now. And they had to put on all the like dishes, the like plates, and also all the furniture that Mary and Francis had. This was like a very provocative thing to do. And then an English guy was visiting France. He saw this and he was just like, oh, Jesus. He drew a picture. He's like, this is what they have on their plates. And he went and told William Cecil. And William Cecil was like, ooh, I can use this for my own scheming reasons. And apparently his drawing of like this heraldic plate was like William Cecil. He kept it in his files for like decades because he's just like, oh, that's treason. The de Guises didn't stop with just plates. Um, letters and official documents were sent out to the rulers of Europe, like other countries. They were being like, hey, guess what? Francis and Mary are <laughs> the king and queen of Scotland, England, and Ireland. Don't worry about it. That's just happened. By that summer, when Mary was like making her way to church, people would be like, you know, make way for the queen or whatever to like get people to get out of the way. And they started yelling, make way for the queen of England. Like what was happening was not subtle. There was no, you couldn't confuse what was happening. Like they were literally being like, oh, she's the queen of England. And we, everyone in France thinks that now. In Rain the TV show, there was a scene where Mary and Francis went to a jousting tournament, I think. And she showed up wearing like red and gold, which were like the colors of England. And I was like, oh, her, I'm in my pills. Like it was very, again, Rain, accurate in that sense. So, but like just saying she was the queen of England is enough to like make that be true. So the de Guises went to the Pope to be like, make this official, please. But the Pope was like, mm, no. And why was the Pope like, no? Because he was pals with Spain, enters the chat. So the king of Spain at this point is goddamn Philip, who was the one who's married to Mary I and was a shitty husband to her. Anyway, so the Pope was bros with Philip of Spain. And Philip of Spain wanted... Spain, England to get along for like various reasons, one of which was he wanted Elizabeth to marry him. So the Pope wouldn't make this official. And then eventually this is just all kind of getting weird. And so eventually the King of France was like, the de Guises are getting like too powerful here. So he's like, uh, let's make France and Spain be friends now to like challenge England, which he did by... So remember, Mary had grown up with the French princes and princesses. One of them was called Elizabeth. They were like best friends, like her and Elizabeth. They would make marmalade. <laughs> they would play act being peasants. Anyway, they, Elizabeth was married off to Philip in Spain. And we're going to talk about her and that marriage in a future episode. So Mary's BFF shipped away. Very sad. Fun fact, that marriage is the marriage being celebrated in the pilot episode of Rain, the TV show. Anyway, so... Basically, the de Guises and Mary had to like U-turn. They had to be like, oh, let's stop calling you Queen of England because, yeah, that didn't work. As I mentioned before, when Mary was stressed, her illness, her like chronic illness would trigger. And so it was around this point that she had what is seems like a porphyria attack um, because she was like trapped between what her uncles wanted and what the king wanted. And she's just like, I just want to like make marmalade and like vibe out, do some dancing. And then at a jousting tournament, her father-in-law, the king, got a splinter in his eye that went to his brain and killed him. So he died. Well, he died slowly, actually. He was just like gr gruesomely injured. Mary and Francis watched day and night by his bedside for 10 days, and then he died of a massive stroke. So Mary, five months short of her 17th birthday, was now the Queen of France. And so it was time for a coronation, but it's like they just had the wedding, which was like happy and nice, but I was just kind of like, Ugh, this pretty bleak coronation of a boy king. This occurred at Rheims, the holiest city of France and traditional spot for coronations. Mary watched as a spectator because the ceremony for queens was held separately and often later. Like, for instance, Catherine de' Medici hadn't been crowned until two years after her husband. So Mary was just kind of like watching this happen, which is too bad because she was kind of the star quality. 
Francis was like, she loved him and he was sweet and nice, but like he didn't have that like it factor. But also note, like the reason why the coronations were separate for kings and queens is the queen of France was a dependent of the king, not the partner of the king. She was a consort. And if he died, she wouldn't take over. Like she, this was really showing like the king is in charge and she's just the wife of the king. So for this event, Mary sat with Catherine de' Medici and the remaining princesses who were all wearing black, which was weird in that time and place. So black was the color in Italy for mourning and Catherine de' Medici was from Florence. So she was wearing the color of Italian mourning, black, which is weird. And Mary was like, "Mm, I look better in white. So she, and also white is like the color of mourning in France for royals. And so she wore white and this made her stand out. She was described by someone who saw this as a dove amongst crows. Speaking of birds, the coronation ceremony lasted for more than five hours and ended on an exhilarating note when hundreds of songbirds were released, comma, in the cathedral, not outside of, but inside of. History does not record how they were shooed out afterwards or who cleaned up the inevitable poo they would have left. Anyway, so now Francis is the king and Catherine de Medici is stepping up, taking more control. So like the De Guises are still there, but Catherine suddenly has more power. And so she just kind of like sat back and let the De Guises like be too ambitious to make everyone turn against them, which they did. Anyway, Mary was doing poorly. Her health was poor for basically a year. So she had fainting spells. I don't know if this is the porphyria, maybe. Some people thought maybe she had tuberculosis. Um, She was just kind of like low energy, couldn't keep food down, fainting all the time. And, you know, because stress is like always a factor in when she gets ill, what was stressing her now that she was queen of England? And it was goddamn Scotland. So back in Scotland, her mother, not doing great, Bob. Her mother was having a rough time of things because Elizabeth, the queen of England now, her right-hand man, Cecil, were just like really pouncing on this opportunity to try and like take over Scotland. And part of their strategy was like, well, you know, England is a Protestant country that like asshole lords want Scotland to be a Protestant country. So like, let's work together, maybe. So Marie de Guise was like, that's not how anything works. Like, can you please just like let me have more power? The asshole lords were like, uh, no. Marie de Guise was becoming increasingly unpopular. She like raised taxes and stuff, which like she had to do in her defense. But, you know, that's not ever a popular thing. So the asshole lords turned against her fully, led by a guy called the Earl of Argyle, who was a Protestant, who owned huge amounts of land in Gaelic speaking, the Gaelic speaking highlands, where royal control was the weakest as well as other areas. He was the only noble with the resources to muster a full size army on his own, like without Marie de Guise helping out. And you know who joined his team is Hollywood icon, Jimmy Stewart, Mary's half-brother. And then just things are spiraling. John Knox returns to Scotland from where he'd been in exile in Geneva. Why? I don't care. And he teamed up with these guys. He's like, ooh, I smell like there's an incel, you know, Avengers activating and I need to be part of it. So his whole thing was he was a preacher who gave speeches being like, women are terrible. Everyone should be Protestant. And everyone's just like, woo! Like they, like he was really charismatic as a speech giver people he was like very persuasive anyway everyone got really excited now that he's there and he got everyone really mad and church buildings were ransacked and acts of civil disobedience people just like trashing like catholic stuff because they're all like woo we want to be like protestant incels like john knox and then aaron and his son aaron jr joined this like mob as well they switched back to being protestants because they're just like dweebs Remember that guy I talked about before, Patrick Hepburn, no relation to my cat Hepburn. He was one of the guys who tried to marry Mary's mom and spread a rumor that actually she was going to choose him, even though it wasn't true. So he had died and his adult son, James Hepburn, took over as Earl of Bothwell. And he, to his credit in this instance, was one of like three (laughs) asshole lords still loyal to Marie de Guise. We're going to call this guy because for his name too is James. We're going to call him Bothwell, which because he's the Earl of Bothwell. He was, remember his dad, there was a whole thing, wasn't he sent to Denmark for being unruly? Bothwell is very much like that as well. He just kind of like does his own thing. He's got like maverick, unconventional styles. He used guerrilla tactics against Hollywood icon Jimmy Stewart in a successful way. Marie de Guise was like, this guy's helpful. He's like chaotic, but as long as he's like on my side, I can have use for him. And she trusted him. So she got... 
Marie de Guise got Bothell to send a letter, like to hand deliver a letter over to France to Mary, just to like reassure her, like everything's fine. Stop being sick, please. Bothwell got like detained on his way to deliver that letter with just like some stuff in guess where Denmark, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway, so he brought this letter to Mary and they met and uh, that's what I'll say about that. Anyway, so <laughs> she didn't feel better, Mary, because like everything in Scotland, Scotland is still terrible for her mom. The asshole lords rode to Edinburgh, deposed Marie of Guise and replaced her with themselves. They were like, you know, there won't be a regent. As long as Mary is like not in Scotland, the people in charge of Scotland are going to be 24 asshole lords, which is us. Marie de Guise fought back. She never stopped fighting. She mustered 3000 French troops to fight back. She wanted the de Guises, her like French family to like help her out. But like they're just getting outnumbered because by this point, Elizabeth slash England slash Cecil were teamed up with the asshole lords as well. And then there was kind of a, a little negotiation, a little treaty happened. Hollywood icon Jimmy Stewart represented the whole asshole lords team in these negotiations. It was like a negotiation between the asshole lords and with um, England. And at the end, this treaty was done up saying, I think this is called the Treaty of Edinburgh. And the treaty said that basically England supports an independent Scotland. Asterix, kind of. So it basically just said like England and Scotland were friends now. Back in France, the de Guise power is diminishing. The uncles were busy. They were too busy trying to save themselves and their power to help their sister in Scotland, which is part of why they didn't send help to her when she needed it. Mary Queen of Scots is just like there, like being like, oh my God, my mom. And her mother also, like side note, was really ill at this point. Um, everything was in case in Scotland. She was upset, obviously. She demanded France sent more troops to Scotland. She confronted her uncle Charlie, just like blaming him correctly for fucking everything up. Uh, she burst into tears and took to her bed. She does a lot of, there's a lot of crying in this story because she is frustrated a lot. So this was happening. And then the treaty happened. So also involved in the treaty were Spanish King Philip, Catherine de Medici, making this horrible treaty. So the treaty also included that France recognized Elizabeth as rightful queen of England. Francis and Mary would drop their claim to the English throne and French troops would evacuate Scotland. Mary and Francis had not been consulted about this and like she refused to sign off on it. Her mother died shortly after negotiations for the treaty had begun and but the fact that Mary refused to ratify this document bred further distrust and ill feeling towards her from the asshole lords. But she's just like, my mom just died. This is a fucking nightmare. She was grief stricken. Her portrait was painted around this time to send to England because amid her grief and like illness and everything, she's just like, I need a plan. I need to like, because she saw everyone was like always switching teams and who they supported. So she's like, if I can get Elizabeth on my side as like relatives because they were like cousins, as just like sister queens, like two women in a men's world, like maybe we can be friends. And the way we're going to do that is by exchanging portraits. So she had her portrait sent to Elizabeth and they started being pen pals, basically. Then Francis, her husband, fell ill initially, like he just like collapsed and he'd always been kind of like a guy with some illnesses, but he stuff with his ear was happening. It's like, oh, it's an ear infection. And that's what I had heard before. Like he died of an ear infection, but it was more like that was like a secondary visible symptom. But it soon became clear that something else was happening, probably a brain tumor. So he had violent seizures. He became unable to move or speak. Mary and Catherine were both at his side to like care for him. Obviously, they fought about who could be there with him, and eventually they both were. They nursed him together. They tested his food to make sure no one was trying to poison him. And unfortunately, he did die. Francis died December 5th, 1560, one month before his 17th birthday and a week before Mary turned 18. So he and Mary had been besties. They'd been close companions for more than 13 years. They'd been raised together, like knowing they would be married. So they were like raised as an inseparable unit in preparation for their joint monarchy. And now he was dead. She was 18 years old. Her mother had died. Her best friend was off in Spain. She was a widow and she was 18 years old. So Mary kept a vigil that night over his dead body and Catherine de Medici called a secret meeting in which she was named regent for the new French king, which was Francis's 10-year-old younger brother, Charles. So Mary, she did the customary thing, which was just basically to go into a black shrouded room for 40 days, which she did wearing her white mourning clothes. A contemporary chronicler wrote, she was brooding over her disaster with constant tears and passionate and doleful lamentations. She universally inspires great pity because she was in a really shitty situation. Like she, stuff in Scotland was not doing great, but here she was no longer 
she didn't have any power in France. The de Guises were falling from power. It's just kind of like, what is she going to do? Like, she doesn't have, she doesn't have a, a William Cecil there to like tell her to help her out. In 1561, which is when this is, the poet Ronsard, the one who she was the patron of, wrote tenderly of seeing her walking at Fontainebleau, which was the property where she was. He described her morning, her white morning gown blowing around her like a sail. So yeah, she was 18 years old, an orphan, and now a widow. She had no place in Catherine de Medici's plans because she and the de Guises were like, what if we marry Mary to Charles, the new boy king? But Catherine de Medici is like, fuck no, I'm not going to let the de Guises get power again. Like you just got too carried away with it. Fuck you. So then the de Guises were like, okay, well, we need to marry her to somebody. So they tried to betroth her to Don Carlos, who is the son, the only son and heir of Philip in Spain. But remember, Spain, Philip was was working with Catherine de Medici. And so she blocked this plan. And so that didn't happen either. If you'll remember on Rain, Don Carlos did appear on Rain in a very memorable sequence in a sex dungeon. But that's all. I'll leave that at that. Anyway, the de Guises were just like, they lost so much power. They ended up leaving royal court and they just went off to like live in their own castles by themselves and just, I don't know, whatever. And Mary is just like, what am I going to do? And what she decided to do was to go to Scotland. And next week, we'll start talking about what that was like. So I can't believe I thought I was going to be able to talk about (laughs) Scotland also in this episode. There's too much France stuff to get to. I have a couple of housekeeping announcements to tell you. And you know how podcasts say that or like meetings are like, oh, let's do some housekeeping. And I would just like to say housekeeping is important. It is like, you know, often has been women's work, unpaid, not respected. So this is when I say housekeeping, I mean, like, here's like real important announcements that matter a lot. Firstly, so this is in the works at the time at which I'm recording this, but hopefully when it comes out, this will all be sorted. But I have heard from a listener and I've heard from some other people in the past as well, that it would be helpful to have transcripts of these episodes. So you could like read it. So if for some reason you're not able to listen to it or you don't prefer to listen to it or whatever, like you can read transcripts and I am a hundred percent working on that. Yeah. So that's forthcoming. The reason I haven't been able to do that in the past is mostly financial because I know there's like AIs and things that one could get to do your transcripts for you, but I really wanted to work with like a person to have like this. Anyway, I'm in a financial situation now with, you know, people joining the Patreon and advertising and stuff that I'm able to do this. So transcripts coming soon. And thank you for reminding me that I should do that. Listeners. Also, the store, the merch store has moved and improved. So there's amazing new designs in the merch store. So if you go to vulgarhistory.com slash store, that'll take you to what is a T public store where there's all these designs. Although I have learned that um, the shipping is better if you're internationally, like if you're anywhere not the US, shipping can be kind of wild there. So if you go to, I set up also a parallel red bubble store, which is vulgarhistory.redbubble.com. So if you live, like I've heard someone in New Zealand said shipping was like $6 to there. So anyway, vulgarhistory.com slash store is great if you're in the US, vulgarhistory.redbubble.com, anywhere else. (laughs) And the new designs are incredible. So because I've moved the store to this new place, I took the opportunity to kind of like wipe the site clean and just start anew with artist designed products, which again, because of Patreon and the advertising, like I'm able to fairly compensate talented artists to design merch for me. So what's happening right there in the store right now? We've got the much requested by you was not planning to do this, but you all wanted it. So it's there. Where is your God now? John Knox has been designed by uh, Jennifer Ferguson, who's an artist and also a Tidsville Brigade member. We've got the Renaissance Reformation Girl Squad, new logo as well as Goth Queen Mum Friend, now designed by Karen Moynihan from the Sweet Valley High Double Love podcast. There's a beautiful two different options for the Catherine de Medici's Flying Squadron, designed by Jan Jupiter, who's also the artist from the Netherlands who designed the Chevalier Dayan merch we were using for the fundraiser, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. And the Chevalier Dayan stuff is still there available and all the proceeds from that. I'm going to keep donating to Point of Pride. And yeah, so the fundraiser. So during the month of April as like that's my birthday month and whatever, I was doing tits out for trans rights fundraiser. And I'm so like the tits of brigade. This is where I say like you're a brigade. You're like a force for good in this world and also a force for just like tits out energy in this world and also chaos. And I appreciate it. 
So during that, during the fundraiser, so the total we raised was $1,646 US dollars. And so that money is going towards the Trevor Project, as well as to Point of Pride, as well as to some other local organizations that were singled out by some of you. And amazing. $1,646 donated to trans-affirming charities. You love to see it. And I'm, I want to shout out all the people who donated, not all of whom left their names, but of those who left their names, um, I'm going to say them now. So we have Vanessa, Shannon, Holland, Katie, Hal, Catherine, Renata, Lily, Abigail, Britt, Karen, Katrina, Irene, Rebecca, Courtney, Laura Lee, on behalf of Rowan, Laura Lee, Beth, Jamie, Nictoria, Alistair, Anna, Erina, Miguel, Sarah, Autumn, and Kathy. And I really appreciate it. And I really love, I love being able to find a way that this podcast can do actively good things for people. And I hope and plan to have other fundraising things happen again in the future. And anyway, so we've got another episode coming on Friday that's going to be a super special author interview. And then next week, we're going to continue the saga of Mary Queen of Scots, what happens when she goes back to Scotland. Like next week, we're going to talk about that. And then in future weeks, we'll talk about what happened next, because it's, it's going to be a lot of episodes. Like I did five episodes about Hortense Mancini, like it's going to be at least that many about Mary Queen of Scots. Anyway, you can keep up with me in the show. So on Instagram, we're at Vulgar History Pod on TikTok at Vulgar History. If you want to support this show through Patreon, the funds of which go to do things like get finding someone to pay to do transcripts and like hiring artists to do beautiful merch and paying Christina, amazing editor. Anyway, so the funds raised from Patreon are so helpful and you can help me out on Patreon if you go to patreon.com slash Writer. And that's where, so you can pledge something like a dollar a month. And if you do that, then you get early ad-free access to all the episodes of Vulgar History. If you pledge at least $2 or more a month, you get access to polls as well as the episodes. And I, honestly, I was asking the poll recently when I was preparing this, I'm just like, there's too many people called James. And so I asked the Patreons, what are some nicknames I could give for some of these Jameses? And some of those will be coming up in future episodes. If you pledge at least $5 or more a month, then you get early ad free access, access to the polls. And then also you get the Patreon exclusive spin-off podcasts, Vulgar Peace Theater, where I'm joined by Alison Epstein and Lana Wood Johnson to talk about costume dramas. Most recently, we talked about The Woman King starring Viola Davis. We also talked about the Empress Cece movie, Corsage. We're planning to talk about Chevalier. I think that's how you pronounce it. The movie about the Chevalier St. George. Anyway, it's a good time. Those episodes are like three and a half hours long. So if you're just like, I need more Anne vocal fry in my life, that's where you go. And then I also do episodes on there called So This Asshole, where I talk about gross men from history. Someone has requested a John Knox episode, and I don't know if my delicate constitution can handle that, but I will consider it. I don't know. Like I open up his Wikipedia page and I close it right away. It just makes me, he just makes me so mad when I'm reading biographies. I'm just like, Ooh, John Knox. I'm like shaking my head. And yeah. And I told you about the merch store. So you can go to vulgarhistory.com slash store, or you can go to vulgarhistory.redbubble.com um, and get our cute, new, amazing merch. And honestly, that's it. I got to get back to researching because there's a lot to talk about in these upcoming episodes of Mary Cream Scots. So thank you all for listening and keep your pants on and your tits up. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Welcome to the small town of Chinook, where faith runs deep and secrets run deeper. In this new thriller, religion and crime collide when a gruesome murder rocks the isolated Montana community. Everyone is quick to point their fingers at a drug-addicted teenager, but local deputy Ruth Vogel isn't convinced. She suspects connections to a powerful religious group. Enter federal agent V.B. Loro, who has been investigating a local church for possible criminal activity. The pair form an unlikely partnership to catch the killer, unearthing secrets that leave Ruth torn between her duty to the law her religious convictions, and her very own family. But something more sinister than murder is afoot, and someone is watching Ruth. Chinook, starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Nowadays, trends and news cycles change faster than we can blink. But there are some things that withstand the test of time, 
And if you're looking for a connection to something timeless, and maybe also a glimpse of life at a slower pace, I believe everyone can relate to the very human experiences explored in Jane Austen's novels. And that's where I come in. My name is Alison Larkin. I'm a writer, comedian, and narrator and host of The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin. I spent a lot of my childhood in the part of England where Jane Austen lived and wrote, and now that I live in the States, nothing gives me a sense of homecoming quite like narrating her books. On this show, you'll listen to award-winning narration, I'll give myself a pat on the back for that, as well as conversations with actors, writers and other fascinating people who all share a passionate love for Jane Austen. So please, join me as we embark on a wonderful journey through Jane Austen's work. Be sure to listen and subscribe to The Jane Austen Podcast with Alison Larkin, wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.